welcome everyone to the BizHack Live Strive 305 Digital Marketing Masterclass Series. I'm Dan Gretsch, lead instructor of this Masterclass Series and founder and CEO of BizHack Academy. Uh, and this is actually a little mini course that we're offering on, on purpose-driven digital marketing through storytelling. Today, uh, I'm, I need your help. We are looking to break last year's incredible, uh, last session's incredible record of 40 questions asked in our bonus AMA uh, at the Ask Me Anything session that I'm gonna be holding uh, after today's session. The idea here is basically you guys ask it and I answer it. Uh, and so what I need you to do is go into the Q&A uh, on the bottom of your screen and type in your number one digital marketing question. This could be a question that's holding you back in your marketing. This could be a question that is burning in your mind. Uh, this could be stump the Dan, like see if you can stump me with a question that I can't answer. Um, and uh, cause I know you guys know more than me on a lot of topics. So see if you can stump me, but uh, putting your question um, in that Q and A section, we already have one uh right now brianna washington and at the end of today's session i'm going to go through all of the questions uh until we run out of time last time there were 40 questions it took me almost 45 minutes uh thank you angela yon fletes great keep them coming um let's see if we can break our record of 40 and it'll be this fun lightning round for those of you who are able to stick around um from 1 30 to 2 eastern we're gonna go through those um, this is actually a three-part mini course. Um, you know, we've done a, a bunch of master classes. This is season five. This is the first time that we're actually offering you guys a mini course led by me um, and really excited to have you guys be a part of it. Um, these are the three parts, last week, this week, and next week. Uh, the first session, which was last week, which you can find on our YouTube channel, was about purpose-driven business storytelling. Today, we're gonna to talk about the lead building system, the foundation and the six pillars and using that to identify your marketing strengths and weaknesses. And then next week, for those of you who've been to BizHack sessions before, this is a brand new hot off the presses session uh, on what I've come to realize is the number one question in all of marketing. Uh, it's answered right there. The question is asked right there in the title, who's in your marketing seat? Who then what? Um, the, the, the point of this three-part mini course is number one, to help you develop your business story. That's your story of me or origin story and your core purpose uh, to set a solid foundation for all your marketing communications. Uh, we had a great session with nearly 200 folks last Wednesday to talk about that. Today, we're gonna to talk about a systematic approach to marketing your business called the lead building system it's to avoid any more random acts of marketing. Next Wednesday, we're gonna get that right person in your marketing seat as the critical first step to marketing success. First who, then what? Um, pay attention to this guys, because you're gonna ask about it and the answers are here. We're not gonna give you the presentation, but we will give you a handout with key takeaways. You don't need to take notes, just pay attention, enjoy the session. Um, that's our thank you gift to you. We're gonna give you a link to our YouTube channel where you can watch this whole presentation for free and share it with your colleagues. And then we're gonna give you guys as a follow-up some application information for our scholarship program, which allows you to also schedule some one-on-one -on -one time with me. I wanted to recognize our amazing sponsor, the Office of the Mayor of Miami-Dade County and their incredible Strive 305 initiative. And I wanna welcome my brother from another mother, uh, my partner in all of this, uh, Danilo Vargas from the Office of Diversity of Inclu and Inclusion of the Office of the Mayor to share what the Strive 305 uh, initiative is and how this fits in. Thank you so much, Dan. Tiffany, also great to be with you all. And welcome everybody to this amazing digital marketing masterclass. You know, after serving our customers, marketing is the most important job that we have every day in our in our business. 
And these BizHack Digital Marketing Masterclasses are part of the Mayor's Strive 305 Small Business Initiative and are designed to help you become a better marketer. Last week, it was exciting because we heard about the importance of your discovering your why and the story of us that you project to the customers. And this week, we're focusing on identifying your marketing strengths and weaknesses because the first step to the road of becoming, which is the first step, right, to being that marketing master that we need you to be so that you attract customers that love what you do and pay you with a smile. So I'm really excited, Dan, about this class. Love the collaboration that we're that we're having here with Strive 305, and I'm ready to take some notes and be in the chat box, you know, putting putting comments and, and being part of the class. So I'm looking forward to it. Wonderful. It's so you know, Danilo, thanks for the partnership and thanks for all that the um, Office of the Mayor and Strive 305 is doing to enhance equity and inclusion in a county with a lot of you know brown and black folks, minorities, BIPOCs. Uh, BIPOCs, immigrants, but also uh, a lot of income inequity. And and you guys are doing amazing work around ec economic development and diversity and inclusion. And I'm I'm honestly very honored to be a very small part of a very large effort. Uh, I also wanted to thank our um, media sponsor, South Florida PBS and the Health Channel. Uh, as a former NPR and PBS guy, I love having those guys as our media sponsor. And you know this this slide just gets busier every time we present it. Um, we have more than two dozen promotional partners uh, who are helping us get well more than 100 participants in every one of these live sessions. We could not do that without you. Uh, thank you guys so much for helping spread the word about this amazing free service that the mayor's office is helping to support. Um, a lot of you guys may already know me, but my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy. And like you, uh, I own and operate a small business, uh, the ups and the downs of that. Uh, my background is, as I sort of alluded to, 20 years in journalism, public radio, storytelling, um, and uh, more recently, about 10 years now, is what I call a business storyteller, basically doing digital marketing uh, around purpose driven storytelling for small businesses. And I run uh, and founded BizHack Academy. We are a coaching and consulting company. We've partnered with some of the top uh, small business accelerators in town, including the three big colleges in South Florida, FIU, Broward College, Miami Dade College. And uh, the mayor is one of our most important, but one of our many partners in the small business support area. And we've gotten uh, some great accolades and been accelerated by some great partners as part of this journey. Um, I always want to remind you what our core purpose is, the why behind everything that we do. Uh, our approach to purpose-driven digital marketing is start with why. Our why, our core purpose is we provide you, small business owners, with a simpler way to grow so you and your business can thrive. There is no better session than today's where we're gonna really talk about what simpler way to grow really means. And the simpler way to grow for us is a simpler, a simpler system for digital marketing that we call the lead building system. It's, it's still got some complexity to it as you'll see, but it's way simpler than the way marketing is often taught. Um, what we've tried to do is simplify without oversimplifying a complex topic so you can accept, access it uh, and use it right away as a small business. Uh, we have four, five core values, learn by doing. Um, one of the things we're gonna ask you to do today, guys, is fill out a survey as you go along, assessing your marketing strengths and weaknesses. Um, grow with purpose. Uh, this is all about a purpose-driven uh, you know, digital marketing approach. Um, and we really want you to uh, use that business story and that purpose, the core purpose story to drive your marketing, creating community. Uh, Strive Through Five is all about creating community and we are a big part of that as well. Uh, being authentic, you'll hear me talk about, you know, my family and my background and uh, that's all part of just being a real human being. This is a human to human endeavor marketing is and business is, uh, and I'm a human too. Um, I'm joining you actually right now uh, from my father's homeland of Spain, 
uh, really honored to be joining you guys from the island of Mallorca, where I'm going to be giving this presentation. And then this is kind of our newest core value, which is blameless problem solving. Um, a lot of your marketing stinks, let's be honest, right? A lot of my marketing stinks. Uh, today's a new day. Let's just look at drawing some ideas from today to just get a little bit, um, you know, a little bit of improvement uh, to make a couple of small steps forward. You know, most of us didn't start our businesses to be marketers. Um, you, you know, if you can market, if you can make small improvements on your marketing and not get all caught up with, man, my marketing sucks. And, you know, just like, let's find small steps forward. Nobody I've ever met, including myself, likes their website, right? So the question is, what do you do about it, right? Let's maybe add a little bit better of a story of me in there, maybe improve uh, a couple, you know, fix a couple of typos. You know, uh, we're busy, you're business owners uh, who, who have had to ride the ups and downs. Uh, let's not get caught too much up on uh, beating ourselves up. Let's just make small improvements. Um, there are three ways that we work with companies. Um, so we talked about our why, a little bit more about our what and our core values, how we do the work we do. And then um, for those of you who might be interested in, in kind of engaging more with BizHack, um, kind of our the core service that we've developed over the last uh, year or two um, to really solve the biggest pro problem and pain point in businesses between 500K and 10 million in revenue uh, is we actually provide part-time head of marketing services, what we call fractional CGO services. And we really basically build your growth strategy and run your marketing engine. Uh, for smaller companies or companies that aren't quite ready to kind of take on that part-time uh, CMO with us, uh, we do training and upskilling through courses and coaching on the lead building system, which is the topic of today, and the thought leadership pyramid. Uh, that's really geared toward entrepreneurs and small business CEOs and their key staff of, of really any size. Uh, and then finally, we are, are running private courses on behalf of municipalities and for corporations. Um, if you're interested in learning more about any of that, uh, Roberto and Tiffany from my team uh, are here uh, to help. Um, again, at the end, guys, we're going to have a bonus AMA. We have nine questions so far. Our goal is to get to more than 40. Um, as we go along this presentation, questions will come up. Ask them in the Q&A button, not in the chat, but in the, click that Q&A button. With that, let's get going. So the goal of today is to identify your marketing strengths and weaknesses. Um, we're going to introduce the lead building system, which is a proven process for digital marketing uh, that is purpose driven. We're going to assess your marketing strengths and weaknesses in real time. And we're going to get your lead building si uh, system score and workshop those marketing strengths and weaknesses uh, as much as possible. The lead building system has your business story at its foundation, your core purpose and your story of me, which we covered in class one. Today, we're going to talk really about those six pillars, the campaign objective, your target audience, your irresistible offer, your thumb stopping visual, your compelling message, and your customer journey. We at BizHack believe that really the entirety of marketing can be packaged into these six pillars. And that's what we're going to be covering today. What are these pillars? What do they entail? And then you should assess yourself using our uh, LBS uh, score survey on these six pillars. Let's start by kind of defining a term, which is purpose-driven digital marketing using storytelling. This is kind of our mantra here at BizHack. We want you to use storytelling to drive your digital marketing and have that digital marketing be purpose-driven. So what does that mouthful mean? This approach to digital marketing is designed for small businesses limited in time, money, and expertise. Our definition of digital marketing is telling your business story online. That means telling your story of me, your origin story, and your story of us, and talking about your core purpose, your why. We want you to identify what is your core purpose as a business, and then have that drive your marketing. And we want you to align your core values with those of your customer. There's a lot less emphasis in our methodology on the tools and the channels. 
Lots of folks out there want to say, hey, we have the best software solution, you know, use HubSpot, use Salesforce, uh, or they, you know, use uh, ClickFunnels, uh, or they'll say, uh, this, their training will be like, how to make use LinkedIn to grow your business, or how to make Instagram Reels, you know, work for you. That's, that's a channel-based or a tool-based approach. I'm, I'm dead set against that. Bottom line is you need to talk to your customer in a real way and give them something of value. And the tools, the software, and the channels, the social media or your website, are really just methods of reaching them. But they're not at the core of your marketing strategy. And they can distract you and, frankly, make you feel a little bit uh, bummed out because there's a lot to learn about each of the channels. And it can make you feel really overwhelmed. What we're trying to do is give you a simpler way to grow and we want to do that through the emphasis on your business story, where your customer is the hero and you are their guide. Your customer is Luke and you are Yoda. Our core belief, which comes from uh, the great Simon Sinek, is that people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And if your marketing is really good at talking about your why, it will attract your ideal customer, differentiate you from the competition, and make you a ton more money. Here are 10 benefits, kind of like a top 10 list on the old David Letterman show uh, of leading with purpose. Number one or number 10 is it gives meaning to the work you do. Number two, leading with purpose makes you more money. Number three, leading with purpose attracts your ideal customer because they're attracted to you because your purpose and their purpose align. It differentiates you from the competition. It will help you attract new employees. People will want to work for you if you're purpose-driven. It will motivate your existing employees, right? Retention is the name of the game right now, keeping those employees happy. If you're a purpose-driven company and you communicate that purpose, they will want to stay. It guides employee behavior, making them more competent, committed, and con contributing. Leading with purpose sets clear guardrails on what your company does and doesn't do. It creates the foundation of the public image of your company, which is the sort of really where marketing comes in. And it ultimately increases your impact in the world. So there's so many benefits to leading with purpose. Now let's talk about a systematic way to drive purpose-driven digital marketing. We call that the lead building system. So the think tank Gardner, the number one think tank in all of digital marketing, mapped all of the different aspects of digital marketing that a business needs to understand in order to be effective. That is the map. It is a real map. Every single one of those nodes are things that you should know if you're a Fortune 500 company. And when I look at that map, I feel a sense of depression and overwhelm. I mean, the questions that are burning for me are who do I hire, how do I measure their success, and frankly, where do I get started with digital marketing? And this Gartner map, which you know might be really useful if you have a $100 million marketing budget, is honestly uh, a recipe for disaster uh, if you're a small business. And oftentimes when you go on Google and you sort of Google things like what is digital marketing or where do I start in digital marketing, maps like this will come up and that's not helpful or useful to you at all. And and what we want to do is take that map and simplify it. And that's what the lead building system is all about. We know you're limited in time, limited in money, and limited in expertise. And you just want someone to give you a proven process for finding customers online. Well, that's what the lead building system is. And it has two elements. It has the foundation and the six pillars. And we talked about those six pillars. And that's what we're going to really focus today on. This system borrows from some of the best practices developed by IBM, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Link, LinkedIn, and Google, and then applies them to the use case of Ascendance Studios, who you'll learn a little bit more about today, a small dance studio in Doral, Florida, that when they mastered the lead building system, uh, has become uh, an example of one of the best small business marketers in the country, featured in a national ad campaign by Google and on panel discussions by Facebook. So let's dig in. What are the six pillars? And while we're going through these six pillars, um, and Tiffany, if you could put this link into the chat, 
Um, I strongly encourage you guys to, uh, cl to click on this link and follow along while, while, by filling in your lead building system score. It's a really simple survey. Uh, it has seven questions. Uh, what is your self-assessment on each of the key elements of the lead building system? And then you add them all up and you get a score and then you can submit. Um, and that will help you identify your marketing strengths and weaknesses. If you want, you can also just use a piece of paper and then fill out the survey afterwards. Uh, but again, we're basically going to give you guys, we're going to ask you to give yourself a score from zero to 10 on each of the seven elements, the foundation and the six pillars. So let's start with pillar one, which is campaign objective. So the campaign objective is all about analytics and the marketing funnel. What is the marketing funnel? The marketing funnel is the journey from stranger to sale. People have never heard of your company or the category you're in. Those are folks who you need to educate about your brand and your values, as well as about what product or service you're selling. So if you're, you know, a bread shop or a pie maker or, you know, sell milk and eggs, you don't need to educate people about what you do. But if you're like the company I used to work for where we sell, sold marketing gamification for hospitality companies, sometimes you first need to define what the heck it is that you're offering. What is marketing gamification? That's called educational marketing. And that is what we call very high in the funnel kind of activities. Um, deeper in the funnel activities are things that once you have their contact information, once they know about your brand, once they've learned a little bit more about your product or service, they might wanna learn more about it. They might wanna try it out. And those are kind of mid funnel type activities. And then bottom of the funnel is conversion. How do you get them to actually buy from you, whether it's through a sales process uh, or by clicking buy on your website. So for each of those stages in the marketing funnel, you're gonna have analytics tied to people's, the, your success at moving them through that phase. These numbers will tell a story about your business. And when you're thinking about your analytics and your objectives, you want to think about it at kind of two levels. One is the 30,000 foot whole business point of view, which is, you know, at a fundamental level, how much am I spending on marketing and how much is that generating in new sales or in upsells and cross sells? Like how much revenue can I attribute to the marketing efforts I'm putting in? And, you know, obviously if you're spending more in marketing than you're making, something's really amiss and you're not going to you know, be able to stay in business for very long. And then there's the campaign level, which is for every little initiative you make, like every organic post on Facebook, every blog post, every email you send, those are campaigns, every landing page you create. Um, those are campaigns and you want to measure the success of the campaigns, these like little micro initiatives that you're making. And you want to also measure the success of your overall business efforts. Now, when you're thinking about individual campaigns, little individual forays that you're taking uh, to try to succeed in your marketing, there are generally five things you're trying to do. One, that kind of discover and educate, right? That very high in the funnel. Next is you're trying to get them to give you their contact information, ideally the email and cell phone number. Next, you want them to get them to open their wallet and buy from you. Next, you want them to buy again. And finally, you want them to bring a friend referral. Those campaign objectives correspond to the marketing funnel, funnel stages of awareness, consideration, conversion, retention, and referral. And you can pretty much define what you're trying to do with every campaign in one of those buckets, and you should. Once you've set that campaign objective, everything else will become clearer 
specifically, how do you measure the success of the campaign? The number one area where I see small businesses get in trouble is they either don't define what the objective of the campaign is, that's a random act of marketing, that's a definition of a random act of marketing, or just as damaging, they're not aligned as the owner with their marketing staff or their marketing agency as to what the objective is. Now you're like, that's impossible. How could that possibly happen? And it happens all the time. And I'll tell you how it usually works. Usually business owners care about sales and yet they hire agencies who are primarily focused on leads. Why aren't the agencies focused on sales? Because usually the sales team works in-house at the company and they don't have control over the sales process. All they have control over is whether they can generate a lead, get someone to give them an email or a cell phone, that next, that sort of second level. The problem with this is the business owner's expectations and the goals and objectives of the marketing agency are misaligned. Inevitably, what's going to happen is the business owner will be like, look, you generated 30 email and cell phone numbers for me. That's fine. None of them were qualified. None of them closed. The marketing agency will be like, no, they were qualified. It's just your sales team messed up or you didn't follow up quickly enough, right? And that kind of marketing sales tension, that's one of the biggest failure points with small businesses is they're not aligned on what they're actually trying to do. So that's really what pillar one is all about. So what I'd like you to do is if you have the survey open, go ahead and give yourself a score from zero to 10 on how good are you at defining your campaign objectives in a systematic way. There's one other key concept that I wanted to share, which is a little bit more advanced, but really helpful if you're trying to think about that business level objectives, which there are two, the two most important metrics in all of marketing is how much does it cost for you to acquire a new customer sometimes called customer acquisition cost or CAC or CAC. So how much does it cost for you to acquire a new customer? And then how much money does that customer make for you over the course of their lifetime with your business? Also known as lifetime value or LTV. So CAC and LTV, those are the two mother metrics of all the marketing. The equation is that you want the lifetime value of your customer to be three times or more your customer acquisition cost. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're a bread shop and you spend a hundred dollars in advertising to acquire every new bread shop customer. And let's say that every time you sell a piece of bread, after you take into account the cost to bake the bread and the, 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 the raw ingredients and the cost of the electricity for the ovens and the cost of the baker who's baking the bread, you make $1 per loaf of bread. What does that mean? That means that you need to sell 300 loaves of bread to have a customer lifetime value that is three times that $100 acquisition cost. So then the question becomes, are you, does your average customer buy 300 loaves of bread over the course of a year, uh, over the course of their lifetime? Well, if you're like a daily habit, if you can make yourself into a daily habit, then maybe within that first year, that average customer who buys that one piece of bread every day uh, will become a net positive for you as a company. That's the way I want you to think. How much does it cost me to acquire that customer? How much of that customer is that customer worth to me over a year? So take a second and give yourself a score, zero to 10. You can write this on a piece of paper. You can put this into the, the survey, but I'd like you to take a second and share your score. And if you have any questions related to this um, pillar, 
put them in the chat, the Q and A, and I'll, I'll address them at the end of the session. Well, you're doing that. I'm going to get myself a glass of water. All right. So that's pillar one. Most small businesses are terrible at pillar one. That's the bad news. The good news is you're almost all awesome at pillar two. Pillar two is your target audience. So now you've set your campaign objective. We want to generate a lead. We want to close a sale. We want to get um, our existing customers to buy again, right? Whatever the objective is. Now you need to ask yourself, well, who is my target audience? Um, and we at BizHack have developed a um, framework for this, which is called the persona pair. What is the persona pair? Well, when you identify your ideal customer, typically that ideal customer has someone else in their life who they're making a buying decision with. We talked a little bit earlier about Ascendance Studios. Ascendance Studios is a dance studio and the user of the dance class is a you know, 12 year old girl who, by the way, shouldn't be on Facebook because the user terms are they're supposed to be uh, 18 or above and their mom, the dance mom, who's actually purchasing the course. So you need, to, you need to think about marketing each of them. You need to target the 12 year old girls who dance class, who are dancing, right? And you're gonna find those girls on TikTok and Instagram. And then you need to target their mom, who's gonna actually purchase the class and she'll probably be on Instagram, but also on Facebook and maybe Pinterest. Um, and, and that's the persona pair. Now, if you're a B2B business, a business that sells to other companies, there's usually the person who's your point of contact in the company who's going to be using your service. And then there's their boss or the CFO or the head of the company who holds the purse strings. You need to convince both. And in B2B sales, there could actually be a whole group of people you need to convince. So that's the power of the persona pair idea. Now, another idea I want to share with you guys, and this is a really important insight for those of you who are a struggling small business, is when you think about marketing, marketing is you putting your life force, your energy, your efforts into outbound, into pushing out information, content, uh, emails to uh, to an audience, you better, melt, uh, you better well make damn sure that that's your ideal customer, right? Right now, most of you are taking whatever business you can get and about half to three quarters of them are pains in your butt and one half to one quarter of them are like your ideal customer, people you love to serve, people who love you back, who are very profitable, who stick with you forever. Your goal of your marketing is to target your ideal customer. I was really confused about this back, you know, 10 years ago when I was first learning all this stuff. I always said, like, when I'm thinking about my target audience, do I look at my customers today or do I look at like the customers I want to have tomorrow? The, I, I, I struggled a lot to get a good answer to this question, but the, the, the clear answer is you want to. You want to target people who you want to have tomorrow. You want to target your ideal customer. You want to build a business around your ideal customer. And when you're able to, you actually want to fire those customers that are not enjoyable to serve, that are not profitable, uh, that are holding you back. What you'll find is that not only will it be more fun to run your business, but it will be far more profitable. Now, once you've described, once you've identified your ideal customer, and uh, the easiest way to do this is to actually think about someone who you love to serve. And then describe them and interview them and, and begin to build what we call a persona around that person. I know my ideal customer, you know, one of my ideal customers uh, is Eric from BTI Group. And Eric is deeply thoughtful. He's a reader. Uh, he's run his business for 35 years. He's running a sales-driven organization. Um, it's a B2B company. They're very interested in driving thought leadership and content. 
Um, he's also very religious. He has a family that he attends to. Um, he's a guy who will uh, turn away business if it doesn't align with his values or, or if he doesn't think he can do a good job for them. Eric's my ideal customer. And I just described a series of characteristics that are true of Eric, but that are true of a lot of other people as well. And now I want to go and find people like that. So that's where interest clusters come in. Once you've described in words the persona of your ideal customer, the stereotype, if you will, the set of characteristics and interests that define them, you then want to look for the clusters of interests that help will help you identify them online. So for instance, Eric is religious, right? And so he uh, tends to uh, be active in his church, both in person and online. He also um, has a lot of volunteer activities that he does. Uh, he also is a part of a lot of membership organizations. He's also an alumnus of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, and he's active with that. Those are all interests that you can use to help identify your audience online. And there are a bunch of really fabulous audience discovery tools that you can leverage to help you find these interest clusters and identify your ideal customer online, starting with free ones that are built uh, by Facebook. There's one called Facebook Audience Insights. There's Google Trends. There's Google Keyword Planner. These are Google tools. There's also just the the free uh, Google related search results and the autofill that you get when you do Google, there's answer the public. There's just a series of great audience discovery tools that you can use to find your ideal customer online. And we also have a, a whole one hour session. Uh, and Tiffany, if you could add the YouTube link to the chat that you guys are welcome to watch on how to find your ideal customer online. All right, so now take a step and ask yourself, what is my score for target audience, zero to 10? How good at, am I at finding my ideal customer online? Zero to 10, mark your score. Next is irresistible offer. And your irresistible offer has really two key elements. One is your offer strategy, and second is your pricing. I know you don't always think about pricing as part of an offer, an irresistible offer, but it's very powerful way of driving behavior. The, the definition of an offer is how do you get someone to do something? How do you incentivize your ideal customer to go from stranger to sale? There are three types of offers. The first is what you're experiencing right now with me in this moment, a free irresistible offer. In a free irresistible offer, it doesn't cost you anything except maybe a little bit of your time. And we also ask for you to share us, share with us your contact information. The goal of a free irresistible offer is to start a relationship. It's almost like if you're at a dinner party uh, or a networking event, it's like asking for someone's contact asking for someone's business card, right? That's the goal of a free irresistible offer. It's a trade in value. Now, if you're a retail company, if you are storefront, you know, selling products or a restaurant, your free irresistible offer is typically going to typically going to be a discount, a buy one, get one free, uh, free dessert with the purchase of an entree. Those are all examples of free irresistible offers. So a free irresistible offer doesn't have to be free. It could just be a discount. But the idea is that free means that your customer doesn't need to pay for it with anything other than their time and their contact information. Next is the foot in the door offer. This is the critical one. This is about getting them to open their wallet. And here's the trick. It doesn't matter. Psychology shows it. If somebody pays one cent they're much more likely to buy your core product than if they've never paid for anything from you. So the foot in the door offer is all about getting them to pay, to open their wallet for the first time and, and make a purchase. So whatever you can do to get them to buy, that's a foot in the door offer. Now, our core course, right, 
is 3,500 bucks. So a foot in the door offer might be a $1,500 coaching package, or it might be a $397 recorded course, right? It's more in depth than what you get from the free webinar, but it's not quite yet that full $3,500 commitment. So that's an example in the biz hack context of what a foot in the door offer might look like. It's gonna be a lower price point offer that's a part of the customer journey that leads them eventually to your core product or service. And then finally, there's the upsell cross sell offer. So the upsell is, okay, they bought the foot in the door, now how can you get them to buy your core product? Or in the cross sell example, um, okay, they bought this one product, and would they wanna buy something else in your company uh, that's, that's not the same, but is maybe a different division? So like maybe if you do websites and graphic design, okay, they bought the website, now let's get them to buy the graphic design package. Those are the three critical types of offers and you need to have those defined in a really clear way for your marketing team. They need to know exactly what those offers are and they need to be promoting the heck out of them across all of your marketing at every stage in the journey. So if you're not doing that, if you don't have an offer strategy, if it's not defined and you're not consistently using it, then that's a zero or a low score on your uh, pillar three. Now, the psychology of the offer is complex. And in our uh, training programs, we go deep into the psychology of the offer. You want, for instance, to create a sense of exclusivity. You want to create a sense of urgency. You want to create a sense of scarcity and you use your offers and your marketing messaging to create these psychological drivers that get people to act. Another big one is you want to provide social proof, right? That you can do what you say you can do through testimonials and reviews and case studies, right? Those are all examples of helping drive the psychology uh, of your customer to get them to want to do business with you. And then finally, when you're pricing your product, the tendency is to say, okay, it costs me two, uh, $1 to make a, a loaf of bread. Uh, and I wanna make $1 uh, in profit in order to kind of be able to you know, keep the lights on and pay my team. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna charge $2 for the loaf of bread. Versus my loaf of bread is gonna change your life. And I'm gonna charge you $50 for this loaf of bread, because I guarantee you that after you've had this loaf of bread, there will, the, the day will, there will be a different day in, in, in your life. There, there will be a before and after this loaf of bread. That's value-based pricing rather than cost-based pricing. And you always want to use value-based pricing. And if you want to see the very best example of that, then Apple computer is a beautiful example of value-based pricing. They make incredible margins on their computers because they have sold you on the idea that this iPhone is going to make you think different, right? It's going to be a part of your identity. It's not just a phone similar to the Android that costs half as much, right? So the way that Apple has made itself into a $3 trillion business is through a value-based approach, uh, pricing approach. And the reason why marketing and investing in your marketing and telling your business story is so valuable is because it allows you to take more of a value-based pricing approach rather than just be in a race to the bottom for the low cost offer. It's never a place you want to be. So I would like you all now to give yourselves a score on pillar three, zero to 10. Next, are your visuals. You want to make sure that your visuals are thumb stopping. What does that mean? When you're sitting here on your iPhone or your Android phone and you're scrolling down the list of uh, your, your news feed, you want to make sure that when you, they get to your video, they stop. And when they stop, they stop because your visuals are arresting, they're thumb stopping. And the core to your uh, thumb stopping visuals is video. Video is a vernacular of mobile. Video is a vernacular digital. Video has got to be the core uh, of your content. Uh, video also allows you to have greater reach for less money. The videos that we're talking about can be really short, 12 to 15 seconds or even shorter. 
Um, they can be photo slideshows. They don't have to be beautiful, you know, video. They can also be selfies, self self video that you take. Um, and there's some great free building, uh, free video building tools. We love one called Lumen Five, L U M E N Five, for creating photo slideshows. There's another great one, Canva, which allows you to create videos. Uh, obviously, they do a lot of other great graphic design stuff for those of you who know Canva. And then finally, um, you know, Facebook, for instance, has its own inside of the business, uh, the the Facebook business suite. Uh, you can actually create free videos through their video building kit. Those are your thumb stopping visuals. This also includes your logo, your font pairs, and your color palette, right? You want to have consistency in your font, and there are Google font pairs that you can look up about the fonts that pair nicely together. You want to have a consistent logo and rules around how you use it. And you want to have a color palette and you can use the Adobe color wheel to help you find your color palette and that becomes the core of your brand visuals. Um, and that you should have defined uh, no matter how large or small a company you are. Now, once you've got your visuals down it's critical that you pair it with powerful compelling messaging. Uh, oh, by the way, give yourselves a score on how good you are at your visuals. This compelling message compelling messaging is really all about content driving timely high quality original content that is what google benefits uh, on search that's what they're looking for that's how you're going to win when it comes to search is timely high quality relevant content if you want to win on social you need to use atv messaging messaging that's authentic transparent and vulnerable you, if you look at what really works when it comes to businesses, especially small businesses telling their uh, marketing themselves online, it's that ATV messaging. We like to say, you know, use ATV messaging to get you where you need to go. Um, when it comes to content, you want to create content pillars and clusters, and you want to position yourself as the CEO, as a thought leader. You want to um, talk about how you are are driving uh, your approach to the work you do in your industry and you're an industry thought leader. This, this is a form of like CEO influencer. So, you know, influencers can be about whatever topic. My uh, sister was just showing me an influencer uh, on using oats, uh, you know, uh, overnight oats, she calls them and all the different recipes you can do that. So he's an influencer in overnight oats, great. Uh, you want to be a thought leader or an influencer in your industry, uh, in your core purpose, and you want to get noisy about that. That is your role as the CEO of your company is to be a thought leader. It is not to run marketing, as we'll talk about next week. If you're running marketing, uh, you're actually taking time away from being a thought leader, taking time away from creating ATV messages around your thought leadership focus. So give yourselves a score. How clear are you on your thought leadership focus? Um, do you understand uh, what your pillars and clusters are when it comes to content strategy? Um, are you ATV, authentic, transparent, and vulnerable on your social media? Um, how good are you at creating timely, relevant, uh, high-quality content on, on your blog and your, con and your search strategy? Give yourselves a score of 0 to 10. And then finally, this relates back to the first pillar, which was that marketing funnel. You need to have a perspective on what is the typical journey from stranger to sale for your company. And at every campaign, you need to have a call to action that kicks them to the next stage in their journey. Typically, these call to actions are found on lead forms or landing pages, little specialized websites with forms on them. Uh, they're in your gated content. Gated content just means they need to enter their contact information before they can receive that free gift. Um, in your email marketing, you want to make sure that your emails are not just saying, hey, here's what we're up to. Here's a newsletter, but have a call to action that get, drives them to your website or to some or to book a call with you. Over the course of these multiple touch points, that's what a nurture campaign is. A nurture campaign could include up to seven to 12 to 18 touches before they go from learning about you to actually buying from you. 
and you leverage automations and integrations to help make that customer journey delivered more efficiently, more effectively, more consistently. But with almost every small business, there's going to be an in-person uh, touch point, a uh, sales touch point, and that's a key part of your customer journey as well. So give yourselves uh, a score on how well understood and mapped out uh, and how automated and integrated is that customer journey from stranger to sale. Now, in our seven-week training program, we then talk about the nine-step process for putting this into place uh, using Facebook and Instagram ads. Um, and we run you through those steps in each of the classes. Uh, and it's really a very systematic approach to applying the lead building system to uh, a Facebook or Instagram ad. So now that we've talked about the pillars, I want to talk about pillar pairs. So these pillars actually really nicely pair up. Um, and we've used colors to kind of show how these pairings happen. So the first is when you ask, what is my marketing strategy? Really what you're asking is, who's my, who's my target audience? And what's my irresistible offer? And from a conceptual perspective, it makes sense. Who do I want to do business with? And what am I offering them to get them to actually take an action to get one step closer to doing business with me? Who is your target audience and what's your irresistible offer? And if you as a business owner had to start anywhere, I would start asking your marketing team or asking yourself if you're the head of marketing, who's my ideal customer and what am I offering them of value that relieves the pain or gives them some kind of gain to get them along that customer journey, to get them closer to a sale. Once you identify your target audience and your irresistible offer, you then need to actually get them to act. And you do that through visuals and messaging, right? It's pretty simple. Uh, you need those visuals to be thumb stopping. They need to be uh, aligned with what you're trying to get them to do. And that messaging really needs to put them at the center. It needs to make them the hero and you as the guide who's helping solve whatever pain they, they have. So once you've identified your audience and your offer and you've created great visuals and messages for them, finally, you get to the place where you can start analyzing what's happening and building out uh, a flow or a customer journey for their, for their interactions with you. So campaign objective is all about analytics. And customer journey is all about what are the steps to go from stranger to sale. And they tie in together, right? So you have a campaign. Let's say the objective is to get someone to give you their contact information. Great. So the, uh, when you get to pillar six, the call to action, call to action is, you know, fill out this form. They click uh, submit. Now you have their contact information. Your next campaign is going to be an email nurture campaign. Right. So the first email might be to get them to watch a video and download some uh, information. Right. So that call to action is then, you know, watch video or download this information. If they download the information, you then send them the second email. If they don't open the first email, you might send them a did not open email. So what you're seeing now is that this is a circular process where you set an objective, have a call to action in pillar six to get them to the next campaign, set a new objective, a call to action, and so forth. So a Facebook ad, the objective is to click on a link. A landing page, the objective is to fill out a form. An email nurture campaign, the objective is to book a call. Then you want to get them to show up to that call. And then on that sales call, you want to close them. Right? So that's like a very ex uh, simple example of a customer journey and how the pillars go in a cyclical fashion to drive that journey. So I wanted to share with you a little bit about Ascendance Studio, the company that we talked about earlier. Rafael Savino and Valentin Bagala started the company in Doral, Florida. And they had a prompt challenge a few years back. Their 12-week summer camp was empty at the end of the summer. Um, during prior years, they had parents had paid by the week, so they could pay by the week. It was the same for every week. And they were, there were no discounts for enrolling in multiple weeks. And the result was that basically a lot of people took off August. Enrollment was below 50% in the late summer, and only 9% of students signed up for six or more weeks. 
The problem was that this was not profitable for them. They basically should have canceled, they needed to cancel class in the second half of the summer, but they couldn't fix this. So their solution was a new offer strategy. The first thing they did is before the start of summer, they offered a free trial class called Move with the Minions, and they gave free minion goggles for anyone who showed up. And then once they got there, their foot in the door offer was big, big discounts for multi-week packages. Then they promoted the heck out of this on Instagram and TikTok uh, to create a fear of missing out on the great deal among the kids and their parents. They offered referral discounts to their existing dance moms. And then they featured this really prominently on their website and in ads on Facebook and Google. Their target persona was the dance mom. She's the one who's making the purchase. Um, notice that her household income is pretty low. Uh, Doral is more of a working class place. So there was 30, 40 to 50,000 was their household income. And then this was their summer camp ad campaign. Um, you can see that they the uh, campaign objective was to get them to end that mini dance camp, the summer camp trial. Their target was moms with girls aged five to nine. Their pillar was a free trial class on a Saturday plus a minion goggle giveaway. You can see their thumb stopping visual, which is a cute girl with a hat with a little minion in the corner. Their compelling message was move with the minions and their call to action. You can see there on the corner was sign up. Here's what happened. That campaign plus their other efforts led them to nearly double their revenue versus the prior summer, 40K compared to 20K. Their fill rate was at 80% over the course of the summer. Their enrollment in the late summer was up by 50%, idle capacity down by 40%, and 20% of the dancers enrolled six plus weeks because of the incentives uh, to sign up for multiple weeks up from 9%. This and other efforts by Ascendance Studios led them to be featured in a national ad campaign by Google I'm not going to have time to play for it, play it now, but every time I watch it, I cry. It's in English and Spanish. It's a beautiful example of the power of digital marketing to help a small business. And Rafael Savino, the owner, not only is he a biz hack marketing coach, uh, but he's been featured by Facebook and Google in panel discussions about small business marketing because of the incredible success that he's had marketing his studio. So that's a great B2B uh, a B2C example. I'm going to now give you a, B2C, a more of a B2B example, an example uh, of a company that targeted uh, a higher net worth, um, a smaller target audience. Uh, this is a little bit more related to that B2B audience. So Megan Hill uh, was a book editor. She actually started out as a lawyer. She had 20 years uh, of writing and editing experience. Uh, and then she took a break from uh, being a lawyer to raise four kids. And when she tried to go back uh, into the law field, they only wanted to offer her law clerk positions, even though she was a senior lawyer. There's a lot of misogyny, frankly, and anti-woman stuff in the legal field, I'm sorry, sad to say. So she said, forget this. I'm going to go and become a book editor. Um, and she wanted to create a book editing business. Her challenge, is she literally, like, this is just like an idea when she, we met her. She had no online presence whatsoever, no website, no social media, a tiny ad budget. Her solution was a Facebook ad campaign. So the first thing that she did is she went into Facebook, she picked a campaign objective. In her case, it was actually a lead generation objective. I'll show you what that looked like in a second. Um, the lead generation, there's a little lead form inside of Facebook uh, and you can fill out that form right inside of Facebook and, and generate a lead. Her ideal customer was the rich aspiring memoirist in every single case where we have a really successful campaign, and we've some, seen some really successful campaigns, they always are really good at identifying their ideal customer. So Megan's ideal customer was someone who wanted to write a book. They're a rich aspiring memoirist. Um, she knew that they had to be 35 or older because they had to have enough life experience to write about something. She liked the arts, entertainment, sports, or media industries, and those are tend, to, tend to be the industries where people tend to write memoirs and where she tends to be best at placing and editing them. This is an interesting one. You would think that if they're a memoirist, they should be into writing. What she, her big insight is they're also into reading. People who like to write like to read, but people who like to write don't necessarily advertise that on Facebook or Instagram. People who like to read do. And so that was actually a really important insight that led her to the breakthrough. Uh, and then finally, they need to be wealthy. They need to have enough money to pay for a ghostwriter for a book. 
So here's how she translated that ideal customer onto Facebook. You can see that she, uh, they're located in the United States, ages 30 to 65 plus. They match those sets of interests. And then they also need to match the interests around loving to read as signaled by Goodreads and the New Yorker. And they have high household income in the top 5% of zip codes. So do you guys see how she translated this kind of laundry list of things she was looking into, into actual targeting on Facebook? So what was her irresistible offer? In other words, if someone were to put a price and someone paid me for this, her irresistible offer was a 30 minute consultation to answer your questions about the benefits of self-publishing versus traditional publishing. In other words, it wasn't just hop on a fall and hop on a call and let me sell to you. She was actually addressing a very common question and pain point that a lot of wealthy folks have, which is, should I self-publish or should I try to find a traditional publisher? In order for them to book that call, um, she needed them to give her, she asked them or required them to give her them her email address and phone number, uh, as well as their name, which they were more than happy to do because they were going to book a call with her. She used a uh, video to catch their attention. The video was a slideshow using stock imagery. It took her about an hour to make. It didn't look great, but it did the job with a little bit of text attached. And then finally, she talked about how she solved her customer's pain through some very compelling messaging. It only took 14 words uh, in this particular uh, Facebook ad, helping people bring their stories to life on the written to page, free phone consultation, learn more. That's just 14 really well-chosen words. And then finally, her pillar six, her final pillar, her call to action was to learn more to book a free sales consultation. These are the actual results she had from the ad. She spent $429 to get about 16,000 impressions, 119, 190 clicks. That's about 1% of the impressions. It's a very typical conversion rate, about 1% of impressions to clicks. Of those 190, 13 gave them her contact information to ask for a book, uh, to call book a call. And then a whopping 53% of those, seven of them converted into sales worth $105,000 to her. That's a 244X return on ad spend. For every dollar she spent in ads, she made revenue over the coming year of $244. Megan said to me, remember, she started this with not, no web presence whatsoever. In just a few weeks, I built an online platform from scratch, launched a marketing campaign, and attracted enough clients to keep me busy for a year. And this really goes to what you'll get from having a systematic approach to your marketing, to using the lead building system. You'll get more qualified online leads and sales. The average return on ad spend for people who go through our seven week intensive program is $29 for every $1 in ad spent, 29 to one uh, ROI. The other benefit you'll get from having a systematic approach like the lead building system is a shared language and framework for lead generation that you share with your company and with other business owners. And finally, it will give you a sense of control and confidence over your marketing and the mindset of a marketer, which we call the biz hacker mentality. Michelle Rupp, one of our uh, past participants, said that digital marketing before I started with biz hacker was a deep black hole that I just needed to explore and master. And I was just groping around in the dark. Now I have a game plan and feel confident. Our mission again is to champion the underdog so you can thrive. And what that means as a small business is you have the power to pick your customers and make them your ideal customer and choose how fast to grow your company so that it fits you and it fits your family's needs. So your assignment, if you choose to accept it, is to fill out that lead building system score, uh, assess your um, strengths and weaknesses, and start tackling those weaknesses first. As a thank you gift, we're going to be sharing with you the lead building system checklist. This is basically a summary of everything I've talked about, with two really compressed pages. And you can use that to get your lead building system score. And you also are welcome to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me to discuss your digital marketing challenges and opportunities. And we'll give you an opportunity to do that 
uh, in, in our follow-up email to you as well. So we're about to enter the AMA. We have 17 questions. Uh, our goal is to get to 40, so we're almost halfway to our goal. My parting thought to you is from Buckminster Fuller, which is if you wanna teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother to try to teach them. Instead, give them a tool. And the use of that tool will lead them to new ways of thinking. So what I hope I've given you today, guys, is a system the lead building system that you can use uh, to lead to new ways of thinking. So now we're gonna start uh, the AMA and to kick it off, um, Danilo, did you wanna ask a question? Uh, no, I think that they've covered it. Like the budgeting one from Craig is really interesting. That's one I would wanna ask you, how do you set a budget for your marketing campaign? Perfect. So we'll start there. That's Craig Johnson. What is a realistic budget for seeing results using social media? Uh, this is a really, really common question that we get. How much should I spend on my ads? And the answer, Craig, is you need to figure out what is your customer acquisition cost and what is your customer's lifetime value? And your customer acquisition cost should be no more than, than one third of their lifetime value. So that's the big answer. Now, the small answer is this. In our courses, uh, where we do Facebook and, so, and Instagram advertising, we recommend a starting test and learn budget of 150 bucks. And with that, you can make mistakes, you can learn how to market, and that will give you incredible insights into your messaging and who your ideal customer is. So you can use a tiny micro budget to, do, to test and to learn, and then you can grow from there. Um, Tiffany, I'm going to hand it over to you to, to lead the question asking. Got it. So we've got from Brianna Washington, how can I convert views into sales? So how can I convert views into sales? It's a great question. That's really about the customer journey. And we talked about the marketing funnel going from stranger to sale. So what you want to do is you want to start with that free irresistible offer. That is the first step, Brianna, uh, into any sales conversion into any marketing journey. That free irresistible offer, remember, is giving something of value for free to your ideal customer. And the most powerful thing you can start out with is timely, high quality, original content. So content is king, especially in this age right now where Facebook is getting challenged by the privacy, uh, Set settings that Apple is imposing. Paid advertising in general is struggling a little bit with tracking and they're having to kind of retrench and reinvent. One thing that has been uh, tried and true is Google will always surface high quality, original, timely content. And if you can do that, you will win the marketing game in the long run. All right, from Angela, how can you attract the right customer? through purpose-driven digital marketing. Purpose-driven di digital marketing is where you talk about your core purpose, your core values, your story of me, and it will attract your ideal customer. If you are the Yoda of your industry and you talk about all that you've learned as a Jedi master and how you've helped so many different Luke Skywalkers become Jedi masters themselves, well, the young Padawans are gonna come and find you. All right, from Rachel, how do we quantify our digital marketing efforts in order to demonstrate ROI, i.e. embed link into website to analyze web traffic and where it's coming from? Yeah. So there are two ways to answer your question, Rachel. Um, the first is define your campaign objective. When you define your campaign objective, you will define a key result. That key result is how you measure the success of that campaign. So if you're running a video ad, the, the, the key result will, the, K, the KPI or the result will be, will be through plays. How many people watch the video to the end? If you have a traffic ad, that's your campaign objective, then the KPI or key result uh, or result will be um, link clicks. If you have a lead generation campaign objective, then the KPI or the result in Facebook will be form fills. 
So depending on what campaign objective you set will define the KPI. Then the other part of your question is about tracking, which is how do I track people so that I know that they were generated by a Facebook ad or a social media post or a referral. Uh, that's done through a customer uh, relationship management software or CRM, HubSpot, Salesforce. Um, listen, it's a lot of work to build that. And for small businesses like yours, Rachel, I'm not sure you need that level uh, of uh, tracking. Uh, you can just ask them, how did you learn about me? And they often will tell you. Uh, but one of the tricks that I have that doesn't require you to do a lot of tracking is if you use offers that are unique to a specific channel or campaign. So for instance, if you run a Facebook ad with a unique offer, you'll know that if anyone comes to you asking to redeem that offer that they came through a Facebook ad. So that's kind of a little bit of a hack. Um, but yes, you can use uh, tracking uh, through Google uh, that, and you can build URLs that have the tracking embedded. Um, and, and that's the way, uh, the more technical way to, to track. Next we have from Angela. Is there a formula or rule of thumb used to identify or narrow down our key target audience or is it okay to have segmented groups to target? Yeah, I love it. Our rule of thumb is the Goldilocks principle. You don't want them to be too small so that there aren't enough people to actually market at, right? Because marketing is different than sales in that it's kind of one to many. So if there's only like five people in the world that fit your criteria, that's that's too cold. But if it's like half of the world, right? I target women of any age, then that's way too hot. That's too big. That doesn't. So what you want to try to find is that Goldilocks principle, that that nice mid place. Um, when you're dealing with like a Facebook ad campaign, usually that Gold, Goldilocks principle is at about ten thousand people. So as you're building an audience, you're kind of looking to create an audience with an estimated reach of 10,000. Perfect. From Olivia, what's the most effective digital marketing strategy? Uh, at a high level, it's purpose-driven digital marketing at a slightly like one level below. It's creating content around your thought leadership focus that's timely, relevant, and high quality. Content marketing for almost every business type is the most effective and efficient form of marketing. When you look at the lists and go Google this uh, of the most uh, highest ROI form of marketing, it's SEO, search engine optimization. SEO is timely, high quality, original content. From Italy, how necessary is a regular uploading schedule to have success in your digital marketing campaign? So there's like two ways to answer this. There's the practical answer and the honest answer. The honest answer is if you put out irregularly incredible content that whenever it comes out, people go nuts over, you can be successful. Um, you know, if you put out one piece of content and it goes viral and you're prepared to absorb all that business, that could be hugely successful. But that's not a tried and true systematic approach. And you're basically hoping for luck. Um, you're, that's kind of the blockbuster approach to marketing. The systematic approach is you create a schedule. Once a month, you create all the social media content for that month. You block half a day and you just take care of it. And then you just drip it out in a really systematic way. And here's the reason why, Billy. It doesn't matter what you think. It matters what your audience loves. Remember that video, The Rock? It doesn't matter what you think. The, the problem with a kind of blockbuster approach to marketing or a uh, in, inconsistent and intermittent approach to marketing is you're really kind of taking uh, the risk uh, that what you create has to work or it's not your marketing isn't gonna be effective. Much better to just be consistent and steady and you'll be surprised at what works and what doesn't because your audience is ultimately the one uh, who matters in this equation. From Aaron, does Meta, Instagram, and Facebook limit or reduce exposure of diverse slash small businesses despite the fact you've paid to promote? One post on Instagram received minimal impressions per my analytics. So I posted it to LinkedIn and received about 8,000 plus views. 
Um, if you paid to promote through a boost, uh, okay, let, let's start with this. Facebook and Instagram are pay to play. Uh, Instagram less than Facebook, but look, Facebook owns Instagram. They leveraged this pay to play approach uh, to make themselves into a trillion dollar company. Uh, they're suffering right now. They lost a lot of mar market share. So the bottom line is Instagram and Facebook are pay to play. So you pay to reach people. Um, LinkedIn is owned by Microsoft. Microsoft is doing just fine with its other product lines. Uh, they've made a lot of decisions with Inst uh, LinkedIn to allow for more what's known as organic or free reach. And so I'm not at all surprised that you're getting a lot more traction with, Insta with LinkedIn than Instagram when it comes to some of your content. Uh, the, the bottom line is when you're there's no way on earth that Facebook is discriminating against diverse or small businesses. The bigger issue is it's really hard, Aaron, to find small businesses on Facebook because small business owners don't tend to identify themselves as such on Facebook. They tend to do that more on LinkedIn. So it's really not that they're not on LinkedIn. It's not, it's not about Facebook or the algorithm. It's really that you're not finding the right interests to target that are actually leading you to get to the audience on Facebook. Now, this might lead you to conclude LinkedIn is my is where my audience is and Facebook is not. And that is an incorrect assumption. 80% of the US population is on Facebook or Instagram. The question is, how do you find them there? Right? So that's really where you should focus your efforts. Every one of you guys needs a paid Facebook or Instagram strategy if you want to have a fully mature digital marketing effort. The question is, how do you find your ideal customer on it, on Facebook and Instagram? From Olivia, how do you get sponsors for your business? How do you approach them? Yeah, it's a really broad question. Uh, but the bottom line is you need to just align interests. So whatever your sponsor wants uh, and what you can offer need to be aligned. Or maybe the audience that you target and the audience they want to talk to are aligned. So. Uh, it starts with, you know, thought leadership and kind of getting in front of sponsors so they learn about you and the quality of what you do, uh, and then aligning uh, on your efforts. I'll give you a great example. Stride 305, there are sponsors. What I'm aligned with Danilo on is that we help small businesses thrive with an emphasis uh, on minority and women-owned businesses. Uh Next. All right. Next, we got from Payal. What would a foot in the door offer look like for a physical product? I have block printed cotton dresses, resort wear. Yeah. So, um, like a free irresistible offer would be like a sample that you might be willing to give away or send them so they can feel uh, the block printed dress. Uh, a foot in the door offer would be like a low cost offer that you can produce that would be of personal value uh, to that ideal uh, customer. So um, you would need to find a product that you can mass produce that solves a really good pain point for them. Um, so I'll give you a really, this, is, this isn't about, I'm having a little bit of a block on what a cotton dress for years, a foot in the door offer might look like, but here's a good example. One of my clients um, is a is Cherries Industrial, and they sell fifty to hundred thousand uh, dollar equipment that you is used primarily to move pallets uh, in an automated and safe way around a around a warehouse. So they're like little, really comfortable, ergonomic, like little machines to move pallets. They sell a $750 pallet straightener. So what happens a lot of times pallets get like, like off kilter and you can, you can, you know, strain them out, but it's a pain in the butt because they're nailed down. So he sells a $750 thing that straightens them in a really easy, convenient way. That is a foot in the door offer. He's not in business to sell pallet straighteners, but I'll tell you, if somebody buys a pallet straightener, there's a really good chance uh, that they're going to also want to buy his equipment. Let me give you a, uh, an example that's more of a B2C example. Um, a free irresistible offer if you're a Pilates studio is a free is a free class at the Pilates studio. 
a foot in the door offer would be 50, 60% off a 10 pack, right? So they get the free class and then you sell them 10 classes at 60% off. That's a good foot in the door offer. Open their wallet and then the upsell is get them to become a member. Thanks, Payal. Next one from Brianna. When creating offers, what is considered what is considered to many offers? For example, I sell hair, so each week I'm coming up with a strategies plan to offer a different product to encourage customers' purchase. Will that hinder my business? Yeah, what is too many offers? Um, this is a great question, and this is this is really about how many offers are too many offers. Uh, and the answer is, if you're asking the question, you're giving out too many offers, clearly. Like, narrow it down to the ones that actually work and focus all your marketing efforts on pushing those. It's just, you're creating too much work for yourself and your team, having to keep track of all the offers. There's a lot of risk that operationally, you're not gonna be able to redeem the offers. That's gonna alienate your customers. You only have so much marketing bandwidth. You have to market each of these offers effectively. You know, are you, Brianna, marketing these offers effectively? Probably not. Right, so that's what you need to focus your efforts on. Uh, we're at 27 questions. Our goal is 40, let's see if we get enough. How can I pitch my business while limiting my offers? Um, you just need, I mean, honestly, you just need one free or resistible offer, one foot in the door offer, and maybe one upsell offer to try to get your customers to buy again. And that's really sufficient for most businesses. From Juan, how can you target companies as accurately as you target individuals through advertising? Right. So I, I think there's actually a kind of an assumption under here that I would say is inaccurate, which is when you're in B2B, you're selling to companies. When you're in B2C, you're selling to individuals. So when you're in a, a B2B company, I need to sell to a company. No. Companies are made up of human beings. All marketing is human to human. So you need to target individuals inside of the companies. When you say, I wanna target a company of a certain type or size or structure, you're still gonna to have to identify who's the buyer inside that company, what's that buyer's pain point. Often that pain point is company related and also status and ego related. I want to succeed at my job. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to look like an idiot in front of my boss. Marketing is human to human. Never forget that. All right. From Natasha, if we are a nonprofit, how would you suggest we connect to the audience more and have them engage with us on social as well as connect to a younger audience? Yeah. Again, nonprofits and for-profits are the same. It's human to human. The only difference, Natasha, with nonprofits is your marketing challenge is harder. Why? If you're like a social justice nonprofit it's providing a service, like a human service, then the user of your nonprofit is generally a low income person. They're not paying for the service. The pay, the person who's paying for it are the donors. So you actually have two audiences that you need to satisfy. You have the donors that you need to give, you know, ego gratification to, feeling of a sense of community, some kind of belonging you know, a feeling of like they're doing good in the world, right? And then you got to actually provide the service to those individuals and you have to market to them too, to fill up your, your, uh, you know, your, your, you know, so, so that everybody, so there are enough people are using your nonprofit service. Other than that, everything I've said applies. From summer, how can I convert advertisement slash social media posts to paying customers? I have had people say, I see the great hair you do on my coworker online, et cetera, but I want to wait for next time. For my brunch events, I get some people that saw the event. Sounds great, but when is the next one? Are these just disguised no's or should I try a different tactic? Uh, they're mostly disguised no's. Uh, you know, they say, in, um, they, they say in, in sales that a maybe is just a slow no. But there's another thing that I've come to realize, um, and this is from my study of storytelling and storytelling theory, uh, in every great hero's journey, there's a refusal of the call. You know, Luke Skywalker did not want to become Luke Skywalker. He wanted to just live his life with his uncle and aunt on Tatooine. And then do you remember what happened? He goes back to his uncle and aunt's house and they're dead. And that was him getting kicked off on the heroic journey he was on. This idea of the refusal of the call is the number one inhibitor of sales for small businesses. What does it mean? 
you're selling against the status quo. You're selling against do nothing. Most of the folks that you're selling to don't have some customer that they're balancing you against. They're really just sort of balancing like, is this worth my time? Is this worth the trouble? Is this worth the money? And usually when they say no to you, they don't actually do anything else. So what I want you to do is make the pain of doing nothing so freaking intense that they got to do something, whether it's with you or someone else. If you can just convince them to do something, you're likely to close the sale. So Summer, I want you to really intensify what happens if they don't get their hair done. They're not going to make as much money. They're not going to get that promotion. They're not going to get respected by their peers at work. They're going to lose this game of life. So they got to get their hair done. And the question is, is it with you or with someone else? And try to intensify that uh, selling against doing nothing. Next from Marielli, what's the best way to affectionately manage your marketing if you're managing your business on your own before you have hired a team to manage it? You know, I love that you used affectionate. Um, uh, I think you meant effectively, uh, but I'm going to answer your question, which is, uh, love yourself, give yourself a break, don't put too much pressure on yourself, and mark it in the way that you feel the most um, passion towards. So if you love being on Pinterest and your ideal customers on Pinterest, just focus on Pinterest for a while. Don't feel like you have to do Twitter and TikTok and Facebook just because someone told you to. So that's the most affectionate way to market. Uh, the most effective way to market um, is to really focus on, um, you know, just identifying your ideal target customer and marketing them with an irresistible offer. Another question from Juan, how can I design a campaign to test how irresistible my offer is and assess the readiness of my potential customers as they engage with the campaign? Uh, so there's two ways to do this. There's the MVP approach, which is just go create an offer and show it to your ideal customer, your existing customers and say, does this appeal to you? Uh, that's a really cheap and easy way to do it. Uh, but you can also use, a, a, you know, about a hundred to hundred fifty dollar test and learn campaign on Facebook, and you can design, test that exact thing. And that's that's really what our Digital Marketers Edge seven week course is designed to do: is to help you develop a campaign to test out your offers with real audiences. All right, from George or Jorge, not exactly how to say it. I have a web to connect equipment buyers with equipment vendors and get a fee for that. What is your definition for this business model? Is a lead generation platform for equipment vendors or marketplace? I'm doing the same as Uber that are connecting drivers with people needing a trip. Thanks. Yeah, this is a two-sided marketplace and it's one of the hardest marketing challenges there is. But if you can get it right, you'll make a ton of money because to be the middleman is to be is the most uh, profitable business model there is. So, so Jorge, what you need to do is you need to think really hard about marketing to both sides. And you need to make sure that there are enough equipment buyers to give the equipment vendors the motivation to getting on your platform, you need to make sure there are sales happening. Um, I'll tell you, put the focus on the equipment buyers, because if you can get enough of them to come, the vendors will show up. Perfect. Next question from Adelina. What is your opinion on WhatsApp as a marketing tool? Totally underutilized, hugely powerful, especially if you deal with Latinos or Latin America. So, um, Here's the key with WhatsApp. It's sort of like text messaging. It's a permission-based marketing tool. Uh, just make sure not to annoy the heck out of your customers uh, or spam them. But uh, Facebook is starting to in, in allow for advertising on WhatsApp. And I would push uh, WhatsApp as a channel for communicating with your customers uh, as one of the best ways that you can especially upsell and cross-sell your existing customers once, once you have that trusted relationship with them. From Sardebra, my business is financial services, primarily investments. Would you consider a free financial need analysis as an irresistible offer? You know, you ask and I answer, which is yes. Beautifully done. That's exactly the sort of thing you should offer. Now, just make sure that it really solves a pain point for your customer, solves a problem for them. Uh, Roberto, could you just let uh, my client know that I'll be running a few minutes late again? Absolutely, Dan. No problem at all. 
Next from Avinash, in what situation do you think digital marketing slash social media marketing is not a good fit and instead use TV slash media ads? Do you have any examples? Appreciate your time. Thanks. Uh, no, I don't. Like digital is the vernacular of the 21st century and you got to have a digital strategy at the very minimum of a Facebook uh, slash Instagram and, and, and Google strategy. Now, does that mean you shouldn't use traditional media, uh, TV, uh, you know, TV, print? Uh, no, not at all. In fact, I think uh, we've actually, in some cases, gone too far in the other direction, where we're not leveraging, you know, billboards and flyers and more traditional approaches. Direct mail is incredibly effective, um, mailing, you know, people stuff to their house. Uh, so no, it's just you got to have a blended strategy. But remember, don't start with channel. You're, you're starting with channel. You want to really start with what's my target audience and what offer am I going to give them? From Florencia, how can analyze the data collected by my digital campaigning? How can she? <laughs> yeah, so the first thing is identify your campaign objective, Florencia. That will determine what the key result that you're optimizing for is and then measure the success of your campaign based on that KPI. All right, for the next one, can Dan repeat the comment about building the content and dripping it out over the month? Sure, this is called nurture marketing. You're usually doing it through email. Uh, and what happens is you create an email sequence with high quality content, um, and then you uh, drip it out over the course of several months to warm up a client from stranger to sale. All right, from Claudia, what do you do when your ads are blocked because of your type of service? Um, so, um, you, you know, if your ads are limited by your, so for instance, uh, you're limited on Facebook um, to advertise if you are in the real estate industry or uh, housing. Uh, it, it doesn't mean your ads are blocked. It just means that you have a lot of limitations of what kind of ads you can run. Um, now, you know, if you're selling illicit products uh, or, or other things, um, then that's just not going to be a marketing channel you can use. You got to find other approaches. So, so it, whether your ads are blocked or limited will affect which marketing channels you use to promote. Uh, by the way, guys, I wanted to remind you that um, in one week from today, we're doing our third and final session on who's in your marketing seat. So if you have to hop off, uh, no worries, but please come back. If you like this and enjoyed this, uh, we have one more coming up in our masterclass series, and I'd love for you to be there. From Florencia, what tools do we need to use to analyze data in digital marketing? Um, Usually the tools that you need to analyze data in digital marketing are determined by the um, platform you're using. So like Facebook has great insights, uh, Google has great insights, TikTok, Twitter, et cetera. So I always recommend you start with the analytics that comes built into the platform you're using. From Beverly. What would be a good irresistible offer for a service-based business? We don't have an actual product to offer. Usually it's, um, it's a knowledge-based offer, uh, Beverly. So if you are a service company, uh, you want to give them knowledge. So for instance, uh, BizHack offers, you know, here is the lead building system, a systematic approach to your marketing. That's kind of an example uh, of an irresistible offer. Um, you can also do audits, guides, eBooks, other kinds of things like that. Uh, she just, right after she had forgot to mention we are B2B. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thought leadership, uh, content, knowledge-based marketing is really the key to generating leads if you're a B2B business. You're an expert in something, people need that expertise, that's your offer strategies to give them a taste of that expertise and also leave them wanting more. From Brianna, how can I attract my ideal customer or target audience if the product or service I sell is a diverse item? Tiffany, what do you think diverse item means? <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. I'm, I want to assume it means that like anyone can use it, but I feel like for most things, anyone can use it. Um, that's probably what she means. Yeah. 
you know, basically the, the key is whoever the ideal customer is for that diverse item is where you want to start with your marketing. And then what is their pain point that you can solve for that should help you determine your offer strategy. Yeah. Okay. Brianna clarified in the chat. She said, yes, anyone can use it. That's what she meant by a diverse item. Okay, Olivia asks, can you give some insight into how being the middleman is the most profitable business model? Sure. Um, let me skip that one to the end. I think it's a great question, but I want to make sure I get to Brianna and Claudia. Got it. Uh, Brianna asks, when pitching an offer, how can I get the customer to engage more? Um, you know, the offer needs to be compelling to them and you need to, um, you know, you know, message it through videos and text in a way that's compelling to them. So if the, if you have a good offer, you know, it's giving something of value, but you're not getting a response, it's because your messaging and your videos are off. All right, and then from Claudia, Google and Facebook has blocked technology services because we are considered third party. What to do in that case? Yeah, you know, Claudia, I, I, don't, I don't have really good advice to give to you. It's kind of really too specific and also outside of my area of expertise. So let me start, uh, like end with Olivia Meyer Massey's question, which is how being the middleman is the most profitable business model. Um, when you create a product or service, there's a large COGS or cost of goods or goods sold. It, it costs you money to create that product when you sell it to the end user right there are a lot of costs associated with having a storefront and marketing to them when you're the middleman which is what you are when you're in the marketplace you're just connecting buyer to seller so if you want to look at a great example of this think about amazon the way that amazon became the behemoth that it is was not by selling books where they stored the books and then and then sold them to customers it was by becoming a middleman for third party sellers, leveraging their platform that they built and basically having the bulk of the profit that comes from each of those sales. If you ask anyone on Amazon, this is true, actually go to Amazon. So with that guys, we have answered all 31 questions. Great job, thank you for that. We will see you in exactly one week uh, for the final masterclass series, uh, which is about who's in your marketing seat. My biggest number one, most important burning question in all of marketing, and I'll explain why and how to answer it in a powerful way. Thank you guys to this and thanks to the Strive 305 and all of our promotional partners. And we'll see you in one week from today.